Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I'm excited about this series, as you can probably already tell from the videos you may have seen online, the emails I've sent out, all that stuff. Today begins a series and a study through Ephesians. And just so you know, as a, in a sermon setting, it's going to be a little hard to get into the depth of a class, you know, or a small group, but I'm going to do my best. But today, I want to give you a heads up. Today, we're only scratching the surface on purpose because there's so much to set up about this letter. Context is everything when you're doing a book study. Now, have you ever walked into a conversation halfway through the conversation and you kind of wish that you were there in the beginning or you just hear something you're like, whoa, that was awkward, you know? Context is everything. Have you ever been that person with your family where you walk into the movie halfway through? And you're the annoying one asking all the questions, like, what's going on? How did he get that car? Wait, who's that? Are they bad or are they good? Well, that's me, okay? <laughs> I've done that to my family, and my wife's like, you should have been here in the beginning of it. And she's right. Context is everything. When you understand from the beginning the purpose of the plot and the characters, you will understand the message that that movie or that story is trying to portray. Same thing in our scripture today. I'm going to take some time to set up the scripture, and then next week we're going to really break down the first 14 verses more, because there's a lot of questions that people have, and I want to explain as much as you can. Now, understand this too. Let me set this up. If you know me, I'm a disciple-making pastor, which means receive this study and read ahead. That's one of my action steps today at the end. Read ahead. I'm fine with that. You're not going to steal my thunder because here's the reality. We as the church need to receive this message as something to share with others. Amen? In other words, we're learning this not just for ourselves, but for our kids, our neighbors, our friends, strangers, are we on the same page with that? Praise God. Okay. That was a little weak. Are we on the same page with that? Amen. Amen. All right. So we always go deeper, not just for our sake, but for others. As a follower of Jesus, I have a burden to grow stronger in my faith. And I believe I should because God wants me to be mature and strong. And so I consider actively, how can I grow stronger? I'm a father of two amazing kids. My responsibility is that I help them grow stronger in their faith in the Lord. I'm a husband. It's my responsibility to support and be there for my wife and help her grow stronger in the Lord and be whoever God has called her to be. You know, God has a calling for your wives, right? And God has a purpose and plan for the wife as well as the husband. So what can we do to edify and build each other up? That's a burden of mine on my heart. And then as a pastor, I have a burden for the church that we are strong and continue to grow stronger. And that is exactly Paul's feeling in this letter. Paul's desire is to proactively build up the church and so me as well, I want to build up those circles of influence in my life, my relationship with God, my family, my friends, and my church, and then I'll be an effective um, instrument in the mission of reaching everyone around me. Now, Paul had the same idea, and we're going to start with the first two verses, and then I'll go into scratching the surface of the next uh, 12 verses through 14. So turn to your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. And then I'll give you some context, some more context as we look at this. And I just want you to know, don't be disappointed when I give you like one overview today and one scratching the surface of, of a point. It's just there's so much richness in these first 14 vo verses. We would be here all day, okay? And there's a snowstorm, so we can't do that. And people need to eat. So 
Ephesians 1, it starts off with this. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am, gre- I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Now, this is a salutation or a greeting. And Paul was famous for this in all of his letters. He always greeted the church. And he says who he is, what his role is in the family of God. He's identifying himself as an apostle, someone who starts churches, someone who plants churches, builds up the church, leads a church. Uh, The 12 apostles that Jesus raised up, Paul was in that classification of an apostle. Paul is not saying this in an arrogant, prideful way. He's actually saying it in the Greek, he's saying it in a very humble, like, this is a big duty that I've been given, and I'm grateful for it, and I'm humble about it. But it's you, it's, it, or it's me, it's the Apostle Paul who was there with you for three years, is what he's saying, okay? Then he goes to address who he's talking to, and there's a little interesting facts in this one. He says, I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. There's some debates and arguments about whether, and friendly ones, not you know hostile ones, was this letter really written to Ephesus or was it a letter written to the church at wide? It appears that in the early manuscripts that we found of this text, uh, and by the way, this was written around AD 60 to 64, 65, we actually find out that uh, the words to Ephesus wasn't added until later on after AD 65. And the reason being is because he never really addresses a group of people by that name in the first manuscript. But what happened was the impact that Paul had in Ephesus spread out through so many towns and villages around Ephesus that they used the letter as a circular letter to build up the entire community. So in other words, if Dover was Ephesus, okay, that impact in Dover reached Felton, Harrington, Bridgeville, Smyrna, Townsend. You get where I'm going? So what they did was that letter was actually considered a circular letter first, but they gave credit to the major impact of Ephesus where it started, okay? So they went ahead and said to the, to the church in Ephesians. So I want you to be aware of some people's conflict with that. Now, why is that cool? Why is that important to understand? Well, because Paul was writing a letter that would speak to everyone, not just one particular church. So it was applicable to everyone wherever you were. All right, so we could hear this message in Smyrna, Pennsylvania if we want to, and it would, everything he wrote would still be helpful for the church. Um, going further, notice what he says about the people. He says, God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. He doesn't say unholy people. He doesn't say uh, faithless people and failures. He doesn't say weak followers. He says holy people, faithful followers. Now that's interesting to me because why is he writing a letter to people who seem to be doing really well? If they're faithful and they're holy, why is he building them up? Well, just so you know, even in books uh, like 1 Corinthians, where there was a lot of issues and drama in the church, Paul addresses them as saints. Now, why would he do that? Paul would address them so they would think who they really are in Christ. So they would remember who they are in Christ. And to reset them and go, don't forget you are saints, so to say. Don't Don't forget your true identity. So Paul is complimenting them, but also reminding them, you are faithful followers, you are God's holy people. Receive that. Church, you are God's faithful followers. Those who have truly decided to follow Jesus, you are faithful followers. You are God's holy people in spite of how you feel or what people say. Right? Now, that's between you and God, whether you have a peace about that. Amen? Well, let's get to that. He goes on to say, may the grace and peace of God be with you. This is a prayer, but also a, an encouraging um, 
edifying word for them to remember. What is grace? Charis, the love of God, the gift of God, the grace of God. All about the love of God towards them. And then he says, peace. Now in Hebrew, it's shalom, which means peace. Not peace because you have prosperity and you have all these good things. No, peace because you have a relationship with God. You have the grace of God, and because you have the grace of God who loves you, forgives you, and has saved you, you can be at peace. It's not peace because you have all these good things. Peace before that, amen? So Paul is praying, and he's saying, remember, and he's, remember who you are, and then he says, may God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So let's get into more background. What's the uniqueness of this letter? We covered that Paul didn't have to address a certain issue in this church. Paul didn't have to spend time dealing with a communion issue or feeding the needy issue or some kind of moral issue. He was free to focus on what the church should know and do as Christians. He was free to write a letter to strengthen their faith for whatever may come. And then, what's really unique about this letter is it's called a prison epistle. Because Paul wrote this while he was in prison in Rome. That encouraged me a lot. Because what you read in this book is like, it's, it's strength and it's encouragement and it's bold and it's powerful. It's uplifting and it's all written while he is suffering in prison. And that tells me that I can go through hard times and still be strong. That means that I can go through difficult times and find the strength to encourage someone else. Paul is not some superhero right below Jesus. Paul is like you and I. Paul depends on the same Holy Spirit as you and I do. We always, we always lift him up as almost like Jesus. We got to be really careful with that. Paul would be sitting in this room right now. Right? He might be the one preaching. That might, be, that might be the case. But Paul is an apostle, but he's also dependent on the Holy Spirit too. He is going through trials, and he's taking the time to build up the church for, because of his love for God and his love for the church. I want to encourage you today that you can be in a place where you're feeling weak, but God wants you to bring you to a place where you're strengthening others. Can you receive that today? You may not feel like it. You may not think that way right now, but you need to. You need to, because that's what God wants you to think like. We're going to get there in a moment. So this is a prison epistle. Um, we have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. Those are examples of prison epistles. Now, the purpose of this letter, while Paul was not responding to a particular theological or moral problem, the purpose was he wanted to protect against future problems by encouraging the Ephesians and the, the churches around him to mature in their faith. And then here's the key verses. He lays out three chapters of a theological foundation, and then he bridges the two uh, portions of the scripture. The first three are very theological. The last three chapters of this letter are very practical in how you should live. That's why this letter is a profound letter. He covers every base you need to cover to help you thrive and be a thriving church. But here's the bridge, Ephesians 4, 1. Here's the purpose. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Therefore, since everything God has done for you, I beg you to live a life that is the one that God has called you to live. That's a, that's a tall order, isn't it? But it's doable with the help of God. 4.13, chapter 4, verse 13, the, the latter part of the verse, it says that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. In a sense, Paul was like a prepper. Anyone know preppers? and what they do to get ready for the future. They have more than enough, right? They're making sure they have plenty of things. Paul is like a spiritual prepper of his church. He's fortifying the church for whatever may come. 
in this letter to, to remember too who you are so that you can handle any opposition or attack. I, I started mentioning the structure of the letter a little bit. The structure is very profound. Paul made sure that the first three chapters you would understand who God is as much as he could take the time to do, but really God's plan to save mankind and to help you understand your identity in Christ. Then from there, he propels into how you live for Christ. Why is that important? Because too often we put the cart before the horse. Religion is to do religion or do Christian life without having Christ in you. Let me do this list and I'm saved. Mm -mm. Because you have Christ, you will do these things. If you're frustrated with feeling like you're having to do all this stuff, if you're feeling like, you know, sad or depressed because you can't do anything that the Bible says to do, I would encourage you to start from the beginning and make sure that you have faith in Christ in the first place, not faith in your works. Put the cart behind the horse and start with surrendering your life to Jesus, saying, Jesus changed me from the inside out. So what flows naturally is a desire to do what your word says. Don't forget that today, church. Don't forget that. That is so key. And that's what Paul is trying to do. He's going, because of this, this is how you should live. It's an amazing structure that he puts together. What areas does Paul set out to strengthen? Well, this series is going to touch a lot of different areas in our lives. I'm going to have a very difficult time not making this a two-year series. That was a joke. It is, there's so much in this book for your life in so many different areas. It's crazy. Not only your understanding of God, his plan, how he functions, how he works, as much as we can grasp because no one can really truly grasp all of God. And we have to go ahead and surrender that right out the gate, that we won't fully understand God here on earth. We want to, but we can't. How did he save mankind? What's our purpose for being saved? How should I live now that I'm a child of God? How do I keep the unity in the church? How do I live holy in a world that is unholy? How should I live in my marriage? He covers that. How should parenting and kids get along? How should we be in our workplaces or those who are over us? And then, how do we fight against spiritual battles? That's, the, that's one of my favorite parts of this letter. It's a spiritual warfare teaching. How do we fight and be strong for the opposition that is inevitable and that we're already facing right now, guys? Right now, church, we are already facing that. So, Paul is going to cover so many topics. I'm just scratching the surface on that as well. But can we open up the word today a little bit and read Ephesians 1, 3 through 14? Sound good? I just want to get a little taste of what's happening here. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And then I'll wrap up this first week pretty quick here because I don't want to delve into the heavy stuff at the very end of a sermon. Here's what it says. And take note of how many times Jesus is mentioned. Not just the word Jesus, but Christ or Son, Son of God. Now, in the first two verses, Jesus is mentioned three times. So let's count those real quick. Someone, everyone count, okay? Let's see if we can do this together. Let's see how many times Jesus is mentioned. All right, let's start with verse one. This letter, and we'll, get, we'll jump into verse three. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, give you grace and peace. Wow, three times. Like, bro, did you really have to mention it three times? Mention his name? Paul is serious about us understanding Jesus. It's It's powerful. All praise to God, verse 3, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. 
God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. How? By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That sounds pretty important. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. Let me stop real quick. Verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. You can't bring yourself into the family of God. Jesus had to die on the cross and rise again so you would have the opportunity to bring yourself into Christ, to, to enter into the family of God. That is so important because so many times we try to work for God's approval. We try to work for God's love. We try to work for our heavenly father's acceptance. He already loves you. Am I speaking to anyone today? By the way, I was going to make a joke earlier. Let me tell you. Everyone in this room right now must be from the north and you can handle snow. Now, just... uh, a few years ago, we had about, we were, we were uh, it was predicted about six inches of snow. And this is no bag on everyone who stayed home. That's fine. I, I get it. Um, but a few years ago, we had a prediction of six inches of snow, and we, we canceled church. Ended up being like an inch and a half. It was terrible, right? I was so disappointed. Well, a couple that moved from Alaska showed up, and they were like, uh, where's everyone at? They messaged me on Facebook. Where's everyone at? I was like, ah, oh, they're from Alaska. <laughs> they would know exactly how to navigate through snow and make it here, and it was hilarious. We still laugh about it today. So thank you for being here in the midst of it. But listen, we can't, we can't work or earn something we already have been offered. God loves you. Listen, I don't know who you are today, where you're at. There's so many people online or in here. God loves you so much. He's already wanting you here with him. He wants you to be in a relationship with him. And he made a way and his name is Jesus. So good. Verse 6, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Anyone keeping count still? Okay. He was so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom, not us, with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all the wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we're united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. That sounds good. For he chose us in advance and makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. So we just studied through that. How many times was Jesus mentioned, whether it's Christ, Jesus, or Son? 14? Sounds about right. 14 times. Paul is wanting you and I and all the churches around Ephesus and Ephesus to know that you are like nothing without Jesus. And that Jesus is that awesome that you are something to God. Like we feel like nothing, but the reality is we are something to God. We're important to God. And he gave us Jesus to show us how important he is. And he did all this stuff for us. And if we all get on the same page and focus on Jesus, it's going to help right now in the church especially. To get our eyes on Jesus and what he's done. And it's interesting because everything is in Christ. So in other words, when our faith is in Christ, we're in a relationship with Christ. Okay, so we're in Christ. We are standing or seated with Christ in him. And therefore, when you're in Christ, you have all of these benefits. You have all of these promises. You have all these advantages. In other words, you're stronger. So let me help wrap this up today. The first point I want you to take away, and we sang it today, 
everything revolves around Jesus. You've heard me say that a gazillion times probably by now. Everything hinges on Jesus. There's a lot of implications and decisions to make if that's the case, and we believe that to be the case. There's a lot of attitude changes and lifestyle changes that you make when Jesus, when everything hinges on Jesus. Secondly, Jesus is the source of all we need. Jesus is the source. We said it earlier, where do you find your strength? Are you finding it in people? Are you finding it in, in substances or whatever it may be? Where do you go to to find your strength? And I mean, I mean that kind of strength to get you through the really hard times and to do the really hard things. Like, where do you find that? Now, naps are great. Sleeping's good. We need that for our body naturally. We need water and all those things. So it's not like you get rid of that. I'm just saying, where do you find your strength to be strong in this world right now, church? It's being tested. The only source is Jesus. It's the only one that won't fail you. And lastly, Jesus is why we are strong. Jesus is why we are strong. When you see a strong follower of Christ, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. I want to make it applicable to us right now. You know what we tend to do as human beings? We tend to wait for things to get bad before we work on our weaknesses. We tend to wait for things to start falling apart before we work on what needs to be worked on. We tend to wait for things to get to the last leg and then we're like, I need to work on these things. Paul isn't doing that here. Paul is not taking that approach. This is Paul's approach, ready? Important takeaway, grow stronger in the good days so you're thriving in the hard days. Grow stronger when things are going good. Don't wait till things are getting bad or worse to grow stronger. Things are bad right now, so we need, to, we need to grow stronger, amen? Things are also good right now too, right? It depends. I, I preach that too. You put, where you put your mind at, your perspective at. But when, when it's obvious that the world is struggling, the church needs to be growing stronger. Can I get an amen? Like we need to be proactively, intentionally growing stronger in all the areas that Paul talks about in this letter. And church, don't settle for surviving when we have Jesus Christ who can help us thrive. Don't settle for just surviving. We don't have to just survive. I'm just making it through this season. You know what? It has been really hard, but I wanna encourage you to find a way to get through that and thrive too. To, be, to not be thinking that you're always in the deficit but you, you can actually be living in the abundance of Christ right now. Amen. Pastor Kuhn still speaking into this church, and this is what he said. I love this quote. The world at its worst needs the church at its best. This world is struggling, but the church doesn't have to. And that's what Paul was wanting to get across. Let me strengthen the church. When things are good, when things are bad, here's how you are strong. If things are good, here's how you grow stronger. I would probably be that guy down in Florida boarding up the windows at the last second. Because I don't know why. I just, I'll just be that guy probably. Can you imagine if they built homes in Florida and didn't think about hurricanes first? It's preemptive, right? It's fortification. We are guaranteed that we're going to go through trials according to scripture. We would be silly to not prepare ourselves for whatever's to come. That's why Paul writes this letter. Because he's in prison, he's getting them ready just in case they're next. Amen. So some action steps, uh, read ahead. It's all good if you read ahead. C 
commit to the next, this next season of this series to let the truth of God change you, the way you think and the way you live. And together, let's rebuild. Has this past 10 months taken a toll and beaten down, beaten you down, and things been crumbling around you? Let's take the time to rebuild then. Let's take the time to grow stronger in the Lord because in the word, we see how we can do that. Let's pray. And Dorothy will come up to share some things going on. God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We are strong because of Jesus. And God, we want to grow stronger. In the past 10 months, Lord, you've shown me things I need to grow stronger in. And I thank you for helping me. And I know I got work to do. And Lord, I apply myself to your word. I'm applying myself to this series as well. Lord, help us to gather to grow our faith, to grow our view of you, to grow in our relationships with one another as best as we can in this situation we're in, to be stronger for the fight. God, we will never be let down by you. You will never let us down. Your word is going to get us through. And we're going to not just survive, but we're going to thrive. We're going to be a beacon of hope and light in this community because of you and your word, because of Jesus Christ and living out your word for everyone to see. So God, may our mindset begin to change today. I'm not going to just survive. I'm not going to barely get through. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to grow in my faith with you. I'm going to go through this series. I'm going to get along with you throughout the week. I'm not going to wait for things to get worse. Right now, I'm going to start strengthening myself. I'm going to heal and then strengthen and grow stronger. Because right now, I need to be ready for more that might be coming. We never know when. We commit to getting stronger as a church so we can make a difference in this community where people really need a strong church at its best. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, and I thank you for this church. What an amazing church. Keep us safe as we travel. In Jesus' name, amen.